Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on December 6th. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The full mod list is in the video description. The first thing I wanted to do was to clarify a little matter. We had launched a probe to Uranus in the previous episode, but it had been named Pluto Probe, so I wanted to uh, rename it Uranus Satellite because it will be getting into orbit around Uranus, at least if everything goes as planned. So that was the first fix there, and we restore the alarm there with the proper names so that we don't get confused about which probe we are dealing with. And then I turned back to the shuttle, which had a payload for the station. It had a docking adapter because the station, uh, our Sky Nest, currently only has two docking ports. Another issue you see me pointing out there is that the shuttle only has 40 days worth of food, water, and oxygen. That is a problem because we don't, we can't really bring the shuttle back down right now. I haven't tested it uh, to see if it can re-enter safely. In fact, I've tested it and it hasn't re-entered safely. So we're basically treating it as an alternate space station, in which case it really needs more fuel. Now, I tried to use the module tug to get the docking port out of the out of the bay, but I accidentally extended its... Well, what happened was uh, somebody told me to disable the RCS ports on the payload, which was reasonable, and I action grouped that. But I forgot which action group I made that, and I accidentally used the action group to extend the RCS booms that you see there. So anyway, one boom got destroyed was all the damage that there was there. And so I now had three, and so I retracted one because we didn't want to use that one. And so we're using two RCS booms, you see there, along with the RCS on the module tug itself, and then also the RCS on the docking port adapter. Now, I only have two docking ports, and they're both occupied right now. There's a Dragon version 2 capsule on one end, and a Dragon cargo capsule on the other. Now, the Dragon version 2 can't be controlled unless there's two crew inside. There's no remote controller. Uh, the dragon capsule, uh, the dragon cargo capsule can, of course, but the side that the docking adapter is going to be aiming for is the one with the dragon version version two. So I get that off, and then I think about using this dragon cargo capsule to sort of push the other one away and then perhaps deorbit it. So we'll dock the two capsules together and then deorbit them together uh, with the dragon version two unmanned, of course. Uh, so, yeah, that is the idea. Now, uh, why won't I do it manned? It's because I think that the Dragon version 2 capsule there is not safe for re-entry because the Super Dracos are sticking out. Okay, so here I go, but what I don't notice is that I failed to refuel this little Dragon capsule, and so it's got a critically low amount of MMH and N204, in fact, too little to dock up with the station again to refuel. So that's a problem, and obviously not enough to dock with this, so I send two Kerbals over. I think it was uh, Pixeled Fox and Mitko, or it might have been Pixeled Fox and Gonzalez. These were uh, conscripted Twitch viewers, incidentally. So anyway, uh, we've got two Kerbals in, so that... Um, no, it was uh, Pixel Fox and Gonzalez, okay? So Mitko stayed on board the station, and we pulled the... Dragon version 2 away, so now we're under control, but we can't deorbit it with them inside. They'd be too far away from the station to EVA back. So we're going to have to just move it away and then EVA them back to the station. If you hear some sound in the background, it is raining and very, very windy outside. Sorry for that. But anyway, here we go. EVAing back to the station. I'm never particularly fond of EVAs. These did not go badly. No problems, very smooth. But all in the dark, uh, it is ambient light adjustment is giving us enough light. I didn't put any lights on the station. So uh, yeah, we're on the nighttime side and it's just ambient light adjustment. Oh, sorry, not ambient light adjustment. Uh, planet shine. Planet shine. I'm using planet shine here. Um, it doesn't seem like planet shine is, has been doing very much on the whole planet shininess thing yet. Uh, I'll have to check that out. Okay, I should have the real solar system configuration for it, so... Anyway, here we go, and back in please. Uh, don't flop around, back in. There we go. Alright, so next order of business, moving the docking adapter into dock using the module tug. The module tug has uh, extreme amounts of delta V. All it's got is the remote controller, it's got the fuel, it's got the RCS ports, 
and it's got um, docking ports. That's it. So it's just a bundle of fuel, basically. Okay, here we go. And aiming for that port there, and you can see this will add a grand total of uh, four bonus ports, if you will, to the station. As long as our craft aren't too bulky. Alright, there we go. And now the module tug moves itself away, and we need to use it to deorbit the the drag both dragon capsules because one we can control but doesn't have fuel in, the other we can't control at all, but does have fuel in. So here we go for dragon the dragon version two, the crude capsule, which is currently uncrewed. And you can see me moving towards it. Now, since we can't maneuver the other side, we have to be careful about how we approach it. We certainly don't want to knock it. If we try to, if we accidentally knock it, uh, it, persistent rotation will mean that I can't even use the time warp trick to stabilize it, right? Because I can't turn on SAS on it, so, I, uh, on it, so it'll just keep rotating and rotating forever and ever. So we have to be very, very careful. And, of course, this being realism overhaul, there, there's not negligible magnetism between the docking ports. So that's how it is. Now using the module tug to deorbit this means that the module tug will end up pretty far away from the station. So we'll have to deal with that. Here the Super Dracos are doing the deorbit burn. They don't usually do. It's uh, actually supposed to be the RCS ports, but this is quicker uh, for the sake of viewers. And since so little happens quickly in all of this. Uh, anyway, I make it the orbit decisively to a condition where it's going to burn up in the atmosphere, not uh, one where it's going to be splashing down anywhere. We are simply discarding this one. Call it a test. Alright, so uh, moving... Uh, actually, I think a latent bit of smart ASS caused that uh, capsule to reorient, but uh, we're moving the module tug away now. You saw it's RCS burning a little bit. Okay, so back to the station. We have to catch up using our RCS. There is only RCS on this module tug, so it takes a while. You can see me trying to diminish our relative velocity and approach the Dragon Cargo Capsule, which uh, does have control but no fuel. Now the problem with the Cargo Capsule is it doesn't have the Super Dracos. It only has RCS or Dracos, which are basically uh, fancy RCS ports. And so we're just approaching that, and at least I get to reorient it a little bit. That only takes a little bit, bit of RCS, and so we can point it at our approaching module tug, and that makes docking easier. So here we go, and dock. Alright, well this deorbit burn took quite a bit longer of course, and so I'll cut out most of it, but you can see our periapsis dropping there, and again I'm going to have it burn up in the atmosphere even though technically this uh, dragon capsule could be recovered and we could get funds back. I, I decided not to go with that this time. Our little module tug has been doing quite a lot and it's still got plenty of fuel. Now this time it's actually going to have to do a proper rendezvous. It's way too far away from the station after this really long deorbit burn to get back without uh, plotting a rendezvous. So yeah, here we go. Uh, here I'm just boosting its orbit back to a safe orbit. This periapsis is too low. It needs to be above 130. And now it is. So now I start to take a look at how to approach the station. You can see our rendezvous meter, our closest approach distance going down there. And I'm clearly aiming for a much higher apoapsis. The, the station and the shuttle are at about 430, 440 kilometers and I'm overdoing the apoapsis in order to get back to them. So yeah, but we do get a close approach distance of, well, about to 500 meters let's call it. And uh, I just verified that stage recovery is working. It did detect the Dragon cargo capsule uh, disintegrating, burning up, so that's all right. And we'll check later whether it can actually detect the proper recovery of something and we'll see if we see that at the end of this episode. Okay, so approaching the shuttle here, uh, this module tug has done its job at this point. It's delivered the docking adapter and well on the shuttle side I noticed that procedural wings, this is V9 procedural wings, have all decided to resize themselves to their default size. So this is a problem. Somebody suggested that I should just go out and come back in and sure enough after going to the tracking station and uh, using that to fly the shuttle 
we see that the shuttle is all right. Um, hopefully that sort of glitch doesn't happen in an inopportune time. But anyway, uh, we can continue bringing our little module tug back. So for now, I'm leaving the shuttle in orbit and our plan is to use it as sort of a servicing station. And so uh, we do have uh, KAS and uh, Kerbal Inventory System KIS installed. Uh, so we could bring different satellites into the payload bay of the shuttle using the module tug and then Kerbals could work on them, attach stuff, uh, take, take, take things apart I suppose or something like that, I don't know. Um, we will have to see. I have not used KIS for, uh, much at all and KAS has changed a lot so I have to get used to it again. Okay, so orienting the module tug so it can go into the bay properly. There we go. Still lots and lots of fuel, you'll notice. All of those maneuvers that we used it for uh, used about a third of its fuel, let's say. So not bad. The reason there's an imbalance between MMH and N204 is that the uh, Dragon version 2 capsule Super Dracos use a different mix of those fuels and it pulled fuel from this thing instead of using its own fuel. Actually, if we had forced it to use its own fuel, uh, we probably wouldn't have uh, had the fuel depletion that we see here. Okay, lining up with the docking port, all of the booms in, and I disabled the, the RCS on those booms as well. And come on, come on, get there, and docked. All right, so module tug back in the shuttle, all right. And now I'm looking at the life support system and I see that there's only 29 days and that's because uh, 10 of those days of food, water, and oxygen was actually on the docking adapter. So we actually lost that. So I decided to make a refueling vessel for the shuttle, not refueling, but uh, food, water, and oxygen replenishment supply mission for the shuttle. And so that we can launch interplanetary missions without worrying about the shuttle supplies. Uh, but in the middle of this, there was an actual supply mission going on. And so viewers wanted me to tune in to NASA TV to see the Cygnus being launched on board an Atlas V. And so here we go. I'll, I'll just go with the original audio on this since that's better than anything I can do. 25. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go OA4. 20. T minus 15, 15. seconds. T minus 10, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Lift off on the shoulders of Atlas, the SS Deke Slayton II orbital ATK Cygnus spacecraft soars toward the International Space Station. Can you respond closer, control? Oh. Listening to Marty Malinowski. Well, uh, one engine on the Centaur stage. Engine shutdown as planned. We have retros and stage separation. Or is it just at an angle? We have locks and fuel pre-start. The GN2 purge firing of the RCS is underway. And we have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. Yep, just one. The Centaur single RL-10C engine has ignited to begin about a 13 and a half minute burn that will take Cygnus into low Earth orbit. Okay, you'll have to forgive me for cutting the whole launch short, but it was 18 minutes long. You can see here it's making orbit at uh, T plus 18 minutes elapsed time there. And that's because it only had the single RL-10 on the top stage, as they said, burning for 13 minutes. Uh, so yeah, quite a long burn, but uh, of course, uh, shorter in real time than our own launches in real solar system, because NASA doesn't have to deal with lag. There we go, Miko. And onto our launch, I decided to build an Atlas rocket to supply our, our shuttle. So that's what we were using to launch the resupply vessel. Except I put two Centaur engines, uh, two RL-10s on the Centaur stage, which is legal. And so this is, uh, uh, I think it was an Atlas uh, 402 or something like that. 
Anyway. Here we go. And now I did have I didn't have uh, RD one eighty for the first stage, so I put two RD one nineties. I had RD one nineties, so I put two of them on the first stage, which is basically the equivalent of an RD one eighty, which is what the Atlas V uses. So this will take less in-game time to get to orbit than the Atlas V, the real Atlas V that launched Cygnus. However, it's going to take a lot longer. I've sped up the video here by almost a factor of three, so it probably took about 40, uh, no, it probably took about 32 minutes or so, something like that, to get to orbit. The colors aren't quite right. I'm still using procedural tanks here. I did size them appropriately. I looked on the web for details, and I tried to get the vehicle mass uh, as close as possible. And uh, people viewing uh, can attest that I took some time on that. But uh, technically, I mean, you see stage separation, and and there we go with the two RL10s. Now, technically, this configuration has never launched. Uh, the one with the two RL10s with a four-meter fairing. But uh, I decided that I mean, it was a legitimate configuration of the Atlas V, so it's all right. Uh, certainly, there are two-engine Centaur stages, and it could be launched on an Atlas V like this. There is a two-engine version of the Atlas V with a 5-meter fairing, which would be the Atlas V 5 uh, I, I was taught all this by the viewers during this stream. <laughs> I had to look it all up as well. So, yeah, anyway. Atlas V 402, just call it that. And here we are making orbit and engine out. So as far as mission matters are concerned, all we really need to do is get this over to the shuttle. It's got the little uh, solar panels I decided. And uh, it's got five little Gemini lander engines. Uh, these are from the FASA pack. There you see advanced Gemini lander engine. Um, and that was just... Uh, otherwise, the Estes engine is a little bit big. And so these are sort of cute. They're similar to one kilonewton thrusters except small and throttleable, actually. Uh, so ver very versatile little things. I'm not too sure how they ever expected to make them so small, but there they are, little guys, and they'll probably be very useful. Here we are within render range of the shuttle, and, uh, well, there is one downside to them compared to one kilonewton thrusters. It's that they do need the fuels settled, so you can't just ignite them whenever you feel like. You do need to use the RCS to settle the fuel down, and now we see propellant very stable, so I can ignite. And I use the low thrust setting, and it does have... Uh, not unlimited, uh, it doesn't have a full range of throttling, but it does have a certain range of throttling. And uh, for landing, you need, always need some throttle. So the Super Dracos are used for landing, and so they have throttle ability. And of course, the Lunar Module Descent engine has throttle. And so that's sort of expected for engines that you're planning to land with. Okay, so we are approaching the cargo bay, not the cargo bay of the shuttle actually, I'm using the top docking port and checking out whether that works. That's the docking port the shuttle would use to dock to a station. And so we're using that for this supply vessel. I could dock it to the module tug, sneak it into the cargo bay right behind the tug, and dock it like that, but decided to test whether the these docking ports are compatible because not all docking ports in in realism overall are properly compatible, so we have to see where these can dock together. And here we go. This is not a trivial matter. There has been an occasion where I took a vessel up with a docking port and it couldn't dock to this sized docking port on the shuttle, so yeah, but it looks to be alright. Okay, very good. So we've got that done. And so our shuttle is ready for the next 220 odd days. And we can uh, do plenty of missions during that time. I think we can do uh, Neptune, Saturn, and Mars. Now this, this is, well, it was originally meant to be an SSTO using the RS-25, the Space Shuttle Main Engine, just one of them. Um, and I didn't quite have enough juice at the beginning, so I had to put boosters on. Those are recoverable boosters. They have parachutes on. Remember I told you we'll be testing stage recovery? So this is how we're going to do it. It can only carry a two-ton payload, which is what you see floating above the stock heat shield there. I, I didn't have the stock heat shield's fairing, otherwise it wouldn't be so floaty. 
But uh, so you see, it's gonna come back with the heat shield down. I have no idea why I put lander legs on the bottom there. Those are completely useless. I should take them off. But uh, yeah, so that's the idea. But I I did this very hastily, and so it's not got uh, it's got a lot of problems. Let's put it that way. But anyway, uh, it does have a controller on it, so that's at least a good thing. But what it doesn't have is like you know good enough communication. It doesn't have the fuel for the RCS ports to orient itself properly. So yeah, problems. But anyway, it gets off to a very fast start. You can see uh, it's already at 1.6 G's acceleration, and so it's got a shuttle-like uh, acceleration, which is good because it barely has enough delta V to get to orbit. Uh, it's very difficult to control it too. We'll have to uh, figure out its proper trajectory. You'll see it go. Uh, the abs abscess goes a little bit wild. Okay, here we go for booster set. Orienting and booster separation. There we go. I didn't put separatrons. Like I said, this is this was hastily built, and so there's a lot of problems with it, including no separatrons on the boosters. Now the the huge fairing actually weighs eight tons, so I need to separate it ASAP. And that's what I do there. Eight tons, which means that with a two-ton payload, that's a pretty heavy burden. So yeah, but we do get it away. And during this launch, uh, somebody asked me to do a tour of the solar system, so I just quickly gave them a tour. Of course, this is a sped-up video, but by about a factor of three. And so there's Jupiter, Io, and uh, Europa next. There's Europa, and. Uh, We've got uh, Ganymede. Ganymede's next. We'll be meeting these guys up. Uh, Ganymede's texture is a little bit weird. I don't know what's up with that. We'll be meeting these guys up close and personal later on, I'm sure. That's Callisto, which looks like it's a Christmas tree or ornament the way it is there. Um, the moons of uh, Saturn's got a lot of moons featured in here, but most of them, except for one, are fairly lackluster. It's just Titan that's particularly good. So yeah, we'll we'll be sure to aim for that. Um, Uranus doesn't have any of its moons, unfortunately, so it's all alone out there. Neptune does have Triton. And somewhere in the middle here I notice my app is going crazy. You, you know I'm already pitched down trying to control it. I wasn't uh, completely negligent, but uh, the high thrust of the RS-25 means that I have to figure out the trajectory to make sure it actually makes a proper orbit. Now. Uh, this is when I figured out that I didn't put any RCS fuel. I did have parachutes, you see the parachutes. Uh, but no RCS fuel, so I can't orient it, nor bring the periapsis down. And this is a pretty high periapsis. So what you're going to see is that we are going to hit the atmosphere, but it's not going to do very well. Anyway, uh, here I checked that stage recovery did recover the SRBs, and it did, so that's very good. So stage recovery is working now, and we could look forward to doing other stuff with it as a result. I'm not too sure it would recover this thing, um, if this thing ever went down, but the problem is it's not going to. It's too high in the atmosphere, periapsis 106 kilometers. I take a look at Pluto. Pluto doesn't have its new textures yet here. Uh, I, I could probably sneak in new textures somehow. Uh, I'll have to take a look at doing that. If, it's, uh, if new textures have been updated for a real solar system, I can probably throw them in and maybe they'll work. Maybe they won't. Anyway, without the RCS active to orient it properly, the this thing tried to go through the atmosphere sideways like this, which is a little bit weird. It'll eventually go engine first, which is even worse. There is some overheating, but not much, but this is very high in the atmosphere, and it's not causing much drag, so it would take forever to orbit this, many, many orbits, and I decide to just revert this flight. So yeah, uh, interesting idea. Interesting idea, um, but uh, probably more useful in a career mode sort of situation because of the full recovery potential. But uh, we'll look into designing these sorts of innovative systems later on. I'm not wedded to just using... Uh, for, for our main mission components, we're going to be using SLS, Falcon 9, Falcon 9 Heavy, and maybe now Atlas V. But I've already decided that I'll be accepting payloads from viewers and so given that, I'll be building some new launch systems to launch those payloads. So on that note, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.